How are we doing, folks? Your host, Moose, here on the Pit Panthers Football Network as we welcome you back to our Panther Nation recap shows. We recap action around the NCAA. The Panthers here in Week 10 coming off the back of a 33-19 victory over number one Notre Dame, led by a very strong performance from Quadri Olison, the senior halfback, coming back from injury uh, from a couple weeks ago to pitch a very strong performance against the Fighting Irish. And the big story for the Panthers, I think, was their red zone defense. Notre Dame was held to four field goals in this particular game, including three of them from inside 31 yards. Their three red zone trips all ended up in field goals. Conversely, the Panthers had four red zone trips that ended in touchdowns, one that ended in a field goal, and then they did have one red zone trip that ended with no scores, but that's because it was the end of the game. And that finished things out. The other big thing for the Panthers, 61% conversion rate on third down. Notre Dame just 33%. So really just efficient performance. Kenny Pickett, a good game throwing the football. I mean, not great yardage-wise, but he was efficient. He did have one interception on probably a poor decision throwing-wise. He did have a man breaking open deep, but he did what he needed to do. And he had 49 yards running the ball on nine carries. He had a touchdown with a nice uh, like 16-yard run. He also had a 21-yard carry late in the ball game as well. Olison just consistently, his longest run on the day was 10 yards, and yet he ended up with 105 yards and a 5-yard average. So very consistent. Darren Hall had 75 yards as well. Paul Lease had 79 yards yards including one really big touchdown run and he did have two catches for 28 yards on the day as well so good solid performance by the freshman couple of big guys making an uh, impact there Benjamin Ogden the red shirt freshman even had two catches his first real impact as a Panther so some big plays there defensively Celine Brightwell had a great game eight tackles three for a loss Sean Wolfgang had a sack and three tackles for a loss Kaiser Artist Scott had a huge interception that flipped the field for the Panthers so overall, just a very good performance, you have to say. The Panthers did give up a decent amount of yardage to Deshaun Kaiser. He passed for 280. They had probably about 100-some rushing yards. But overall, it's just a good, solid performance by the Panthers. You know, they're not going to write home about how many yards they give up passing-wise, but they only gave up 19 points on the day, and that's the thing that's the real key for them and the thing they want to, you know, talk about moving forward is just you know, they limited Notre Dame's opportunities, especially when they got into the red zone, and Pitt made the most of their opportunities. They had a couple big plays, like we talked about, the least 70-plus yard touchdown run. Pickett had a rushing touchdown. Olsen had a rushing touchdown. They made the plays when they needed to do so, and it was just a really solid game overall for the Panthers. Nothing to complain about there, and it's one that will be very interesting moving forward to see what it does to both of these teams in terms of the college football playoff rankings. The first college football playoff rankings will be released this coming week, not in this episode, uh, but they will be in the ensuing episode, the next one that comes up, and we'll see how both the Panthers and the Fighting Irish will fall because of the results of this game but one big thing that did come as a result of this game is the Panthers did get a commit so we're going to go on the recruiting trail sponsored here by PantherLair.com as well as ESPN Recruiting Nation to take a look at the wide receiver from North Lauderdale Florida Thomas Alexander 6'3 good size 212 pounds was recruited by Alabama, Nebraska, Ohio State, and Texas, who all had interest. The Panthers were the ones who offered him, and he comes into the Panthers with a very good skill set, good speed, and we're about to scout him right now and see what he projects as a 66. He turns out being a 70, so a four uh, overall improvement for the Panthers. 94 speed. He's got uh, decent, you know, catching could be improved, only 62, but he's got good carrying, good spin, good vision. His route running is solid, so he could be a guy that has a good impact for the Panthers, especially as a deep threat threat with that size he's going to resemble type of a, a jester we type of player uh for the rest of the acc north carolina comes out with a victory over colorado state clemson wins 36 24 over wake forest duke picks up their first acc win knocking off virginia 38 24 keeping the cavaliers from getting bowl eligible syracuse uh falls to louisville 35 31 LSU beats Georgia Tech, so the Yellow Jackets fall to 4-4. Four four. LSU stays unbeaten. Virginia Tech, 49-14 over Central Michigan in a non-conference game. And Boston College gets bowl eligible with a 35-10 win over Kent State. In the top 25, Middle Tennessee State goes to 7-1 with a victory over North Texas. Texas with another blowout victory. UCLA 
easy victory over then 5-2 and two Utah as they win 27-6. Washington blows out number 13 Stanford. What looked to be one of the games of the week turns into a blowout in that particular matchup. Tennessee wins 40 to nothing over Fresno. Ohio State a comfortable victory over Rutgers. Georgia escapes in the world's largest cocktail party over Florida to go to 8-1 and one with a 23-21 victory over the Gators. Auburn goes to 8-1 with a victory over Arkansas, 31-24. So Auburn 8-1 making some noise for the playoff as well. Virginia Tech, LSU winning like we saw. Alabama blows out Washington State, who's really struggled this year, 42-7 for the Crimson Tide. Arkansas State, we know the darlings of the Sun Belt, who got into a BCS Bowl last year with a victory over South Alabama. Easy win there. Temple knocks off number 23 Cincinnati, so that probably puts any dents into Cincinnati's hopes of sneaking into a BCS type bowl or a, a, a Power Six or whatever you want to call it, New Year's Six Bowl, as we like to call it. And so, NCAA Player of the Week, Joel Ayegbunyue from Western Kentucky, two sacks, nine tackles, four for a loss, forced to fumble, and a pick in the victory over Florida International. Frank Newtile from Tech, uh, from Temple, excuse me, 315 yards passing, seven total touchdowns in that upset victory over Cincinnati for the Owls. So big performance by the redshirt senior quarterback. ACC-wise, Lamar Jackson, another solid performance. 207 passing, 155 yards rushing. So 350 total yards and five touchdowns in victory over Syracuse. Dylan Singleton, the junior free safety, two picks in the victory over Virginia for the Blue Devils. Heisman race now. Lamar Jackson, big performance, puts him back into the thick of it. Darius Geis actually goes up to number one in the victory over Georgia Tech. He had 164 yards, I think a couple of touchdowns. Big performance there. Deshaun Kaiser, just one touchdown, 300 yards in the loss to Pitt. Hurts his candidacy for the Heisman race. Lamar Jackson in that five touchdown, 350 yard performance, puts him into the race. Joe Burrow, the junior redshirt quarterback for Ohio State has a good solid game. 223 yards, 54 rushing, and three total touchdowns for the Buckeyes over Rutgers. Gets him into the thick of things. Josh Rosen goes out of the game against Utah injured. He's scheduled to miss potentially the next couple of games. That's really going to hurt any opportunity he may have had at the Heisman race for the senior quarterback for the Bruins. But the Bruins still have hopes for the national title. They are in the top four right now in the coaches' poll. LSU 1, Washington 2, Ohio State 3, UCLA 4, Oklahoma 5, as Notre Dame falls all the way to number 8 after their loss to the Pitt Panthers, who in the coaches' poll jump up to number 12. Georgia goes up to 6, Bama stays at 7, Penn State stays at 9, Texas at 10. So your top 10, same 10 teams. It's just a little bit reshuffled after that Pitt upset win over Notre Dame in South Bend. Clemson's 11. Pitt jumps up to 12 with their victory. So what remains to be seen, though, for the Panthers is where they'll look in the college football playoff. Because, again, they don't have to go by the polls. They go by the resumes of the teams. And you have to think that victory for the Panthers, coupled with the fact that they only have one loss, they've beaten teams like Virginia Tech already this season. They have some good quality wins. You'd expect to see them, you know, doing well in the college football playoff polls. But there's a lot of other teams. Auburn, for example, they have one loss but they're number 15 in the coaches poll so they could have something to say nc state only one loss they're number 18 colorado with one loss is number 22 so some power five schools that could have something to say as far as the playoff polls are concerned but that's where they fall out in the coaches poll if the bcs was still in effect like it was the last two seasons it is not this year and so because of that we can see LSU and Washington would be the current title game if the BCS were in effect. But UCLA, Ohio State, and Oklahoma all in the vicinity as it stands right now. Georgia at 6, Bama at 7, Notre Dame at 8, Pitt at 9 via the BCS. So you can see the computers and the pollsters there consider the Panthers a lot higher due to their strength of schedule, their strength of victories so far. And I think we'll see something fairly similar when the college football playoff standings come out. I think the only thing you could quibble over is maybe the, the Irish versus the Panthers who's in front there based on their resumes and of course their head-to-head -head results. But the remainder of your BCS tanks can be seen below. Additionally, the ACC title still up for you know grabs. The Panthers as well as Virginia Tech Hokies and Miami Hurricanes are really the, the front runners for the Coastal. The Panthers and the Hurricanes still have to play this year so that could decide the conference depending on how things shake out. 
uh, Virginia Tech needs some help to try and win the conference. Miami or Pitt could just win out and claim the conference title uh, if you know things go their way. In the Atlantic, Florida State, NC State. NC State still can win out and claim the title even though they lost to Clemson because they do have the head-to-head over Florida State. Louisville, Clemson, BC all technically in with a chance for the Atlantic, but they would need some help to get those titles. So, Without further ado, we'll go into the big games for this week. You can see in the ACC some big conference matchups coming up. Florida State and Clemson is really the highlight this week. But we have BC taking on NC State. The Wolfpack looking to go to 8-1 and one and really improve their resume. We have Ohio, uh, excuse me, Oklahoma hosting West Virginia in a big Big 12 showdown. You got Stanford taking on South Carolina, one of the biggest non-conference matchups of the week. The Cardinal looking to rebound after getting blown out by Washington last week. You got Michigan heading to Happy Valley to take on number nine Penn State. That should be a big showdown. Harbaugh's really going to need to come away with a victory if he wants to increase his job security. There's no doubt about that. Ohio State heads to Michigan State, who actually just beat Michigan last week. And so uh, the Buckeyes look to stay unbeaten and stay uh, en route for the playoff. Florida State and Clemson. Clemson has to win this if they want any hope of potentially sneaking into the ACC title game for the the fourth year in a row. Uh, Colorado, UCLA. This is a huge game for the Buffs to prove that they're for real. Of course, the Bruins will be missing Josh Rosen. And then the Peace de Resistance, LSU, Bama, in Tuscaloosa. Are the Tigers for real? There will be the question. And for your Pitt Panthers, they will host the Georgia Tech Yellow Jackets, who've been up and down this season. Four and four, it's their first year abandoning the option attack. They've still got a lot of talent on the roster. You can see by their team rating, they're about the same as the Panthers. Their passing attack has actually been more prolific than the Panthers. They still have a really strong rushing attack, over 209 yards uh, a game, which means they're very, very balanced. And they've got an okay defense. It's not been great against the run. That bodes well for the Panthers. Uh, but Georgia Tech's been inconsistent this year to say the least you can see they barely scraped by it with an overtime victory against Tulane they blew out an FCS school they narrowly lost to Louisville uh, by just six points then but then they barely got by Wake Forest they were blown out by Virginia Tech who the Panthers uh, obliterated this season they lost in a tight battle to Virginia they beat North Carolina 34-17 but the Tar Heels have been struggling this year they lost to LSU 34-21 last week so it's one of those things where if you have to go by recent events, Georgia Tech should not be an issue for the Panthers. But they have always been, you know, typically a tough team for the Panthers to face, especially with a quarterback who can run. Jordan in his first year really passing the football. He does have 18 touchdowns through the air, only six interceptions, but he's under 50% completion percentage. So very erratic, not a ton of yardage uh, for the redshirt senior quarterback, but they do have a lot of good runners on the field. They got CRC, Leggett, some couple guys that can really rush the football. The Panthers are no stranger to that either. They got Darren Hall currently averaging over 100 yards a game running the football. Quadri Olsen we know put up 100 yards and he's basically at about 100 yards a game as well for the Panthers. They're going to try and lean on that rushing attack, keep Georgia Tech off the field, and just really grind them down. I think that's the overall goal for the Panthers. But if we look at uh, Georgia Tech, the big thing to take note of them, Lane Kiffin is their head coach. They have Ted Roof as well, defensive coordinator, uh, but Lane Kiffin as the head coach has really changed up the kind of offense that you're going to see Georgia Georgia Tech run. It's going to be a lot more spread type stuff. They will still run the football because they have the personnel for that. But overall, they're going to depend on their depth. They're going to depend on, you know, trying to get the football down the field in chunks against you because they don't really have that kind of big play receiver or big play quarterback, to be honest, to make the throw. Uh, Jordan's just not that guy. They do have some solid running backs in Searcy. They have Lynch. They have Leggett, like we mentioned, who technically is listed as a fullback, but he does get a lot of carries in this offense. So good solid players they have a nice receiving core as well they're all mid 80s or so but nobody that's really going to blow you away and that's what we're talking about cj leggett as a fullback he's 84 overall but he's got 90 speed very very solid player he's essentially a halfback he's just listed as a fullback because he was in that triple option offense matthew jordan of course like we mentioned Inconsistent throwing the ball, to say at least, but 18 touchdowns is pretty impressive, especially for the limited yards that he does throw for. You can see he's missed a, f a couple of games this season, I believe, is why he's got you know a decent yardage there. Take one, Marshall is a good, solid backup, a guy that should be actually very good for them next year, I would expect as their starter. But Qua Searcy is their leading rusher. He's averaging about 72 yards a game, 506 yards rushing the football. Clinton Lynch about 100 yards, but Leggett is the real guy that you can expect to carry uh, a good load for them as well. Marcus Marshall 
role has been missing for a lot of the season. Leggett, though, 490 yards. You can see there, so 61 yards a game. He's a good, solid contributor for them in this particular season. 600 yards as well last season for the redshirt senior from Georgia. So they're going to try and move the football, but you can see receiving-wise, they have Phil Putt, they have Lance Davis, they have Howell, some good guys who can move the ball if needed. Decent speed, not terrible. They have no real tight ends just because of the way their offense used to be run, so don't expect much from the tight end position. I think the Panthers can at least uh, you know count on that, but they're fairly solid across the board. You can expect a lot of 80s. You know That's the thing when you look at their lineup. They don't have anybody that's really going to stand out at you, but pretty much their entire starting lineup is all mid 80s, so it's average, decent, uh, something that the Panthers can expect to not really find any true weaknesses. Uh, but with the quality that the Panthers have shown rushing the ball, their schematics should do well against this Georgia Tech defense. Lamont Simmons is kind of their one stud player. He should be a very good cornerback at the NFL level. But the Panthers don't pass the ball that much anyway, so he shouldn't be too, too much of a factor. If the Panthers can stick to their rushing attack and beat up Georgia on the front, Georgia Tech on the front lines, they should be able to carve out an early advantage. They'll have the home crowd behind them. This Georgia Tech offense doesn't really know who it wants to be yet. It kind of flips between the rush and the pass. So if the Panthers can shut down that rushing attack, force the inconsistent Jordan into having to pass the ball, it should be a good day at home for the Panthers. So let me know what you think is going to happen in the comments. Let me know in the college football playoff where you think the Panthers will come out ranked. Hail to Pitt. As always, we'll talk to you guys soon. See you later. Take care. Bye-bye.